Welcome to today's webinar, Measurement and Evaluation of Community Engagement. My name is Allison Homer, Manager of Learning, Evaluation, and Policy with Comerex, and I'm here today with Mark Holmgren, Senior Director of Vibrant Communities Canada, also with Comerex. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Mark. Mark is driven by the desire to change community conditions that cause and perpetuate poverty and the marginalization of vulnerable and disadvantaged. A proven leader of poverty reduction efforts, Mark is known for his innovative eye and his ability to converge big picture thinking with on the ground implementation. As the Director of Vibrant Communities Canada, Mark leads Tamarack's engagement with 75 member communities leading, leading local poverty reduction efforts and works with his team to develop learning opportunities and resources that add value to this pan Canadian network. In addition to his ability to facilitate groups of all sizes around strategy development and solution building, Mark has built and delivered curriculum related to collective impact, community innovation, strategic planning, and nonprofit leadership. Mark is a provocative speaker who challenges the status quo and fosters new and innovative ways of seeing and addressing social issues. Prior to joining Tamarack, Mark was one of the Institute's national thought leaders for three years. Previous roles and positions include leading a team of 120 staff as the CEO of Bissell Center in Edmonton, a multi-service organization dedicated to ending poverty. Also serving as an executive staff for the United Way and providing an array of organizational change consulting services for 20 years to social service agencies, educational institutions, health organizations, as well as local governments. Welcome, Mark. Thank you for joining us on today's broadcast, and I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Allison. Glad to be here. Um, the genesis of this presentation uh, kind of started back a few months ago when I was part of the uh, team that spoke in Vancouver at our community engagement uh, uh, multi-day event. And I was doing a plenary on this topic, and uh, we got into so much conversation that I never uh, finished the entire presentation, so the group asked if I would follow up with a webinar. So um, this webinar includes some of the elements from that presentation uh, and then some other things that I've, I've added uh, since. So uh, what I'm going to cover today, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how your community engagement plan actually informs your evaluation, touch on the community engagement spectrum, uh, give some uh, consideration to how you design community engagement, talk about uh, how, how you might consider measures for community engagement when you want to do capacity building, what are some of the signals of engagement, how do you know if it's actually happening, and then uh, some communication stuff, and then I'm going to share some dashboard ideas on, um, on how you might measure uh, your engagement uh, your engagement activities. Um, you know, the the idea of, a, of measuring community engagement is a little different from measuring program outcomes. Um, and so I'm hoping that we'll be able to kind of cover that today and maybe offer some clarifications on what the differences are. So I've done in my career as a consultant quite a few evaluations and uh, Eventually, I stopped doing them because I got involved with uh, more strategy stuff. But this little um, uh, Mr. Beam statement kind of epitomizes some of the evaluation questions I would get from people that hired me. Like, so any chance you could design an evaluation that proves all of my movies are brilliant, brilliant works of art? Um, you know, or any chance you could design an evaluation that proves we're doing what we say we're doing? And, you know, the, the reality of this is, uh, uh, sorry, I just lost my screen. The reality of this is uh, evaluation of community engagement is about the engagement. It's not about proving that you're successful. If you set out to prove an evaluation is successful, then you're you're creating a biased approach to to measuring uh, your outcomes. And so sometimes I think we have to check ourselves and say, what are we really? We're really here to measure our performance, and then to see 
what happens. And if what we really want is just proof that we're doing a great job, uh, we're missing the boat. So one of, I know when I work with groups and we talk about community engagement, um, there's risks involved, especially when we actually say authentic community engagement. And the risks, risks are, as you're trying to engage the public, uh, they may not want what you want, and then what do you do? Uh, or, or they want to talk, they might want what you want or want to talk about what you want to talk about, but they also want to talk about other things that you didn't approach them about. Uh, you might hear things that they don't like about you. Uh, they, they might end up, or a group of them, end up working on something else that seems contradictory to what you're trying to do. The, you might start an engagement process where the community is uh, not all that trusting of you or other community battles will show up at engagement meetings that have nothing to do with you. Um, and those who want you to do the engaging, whether it's your city council or funders, tend not to really, um, I'm speaking in generalities, I guess, but tend not to really think that it's a compl complex and complicated thing to do. So they wonder, well, what's the problem? Why is it taking so long? And often, why does it take so many resources? And I think these are some of the risks that you have to grapple with as you're trying to create authentic community engagement. I'm sure you've all been involved with community engagement um, that, that um, seems kind of phony. So, you know, Ms. Jones, please tell me why putting up a high rise next to your home is a wonderful idea is not necessarily a great community engagement question. And so she's being polite and saying, other than blocking out the sun, the loss of peace and quiet, can't park my car, feeling like I just can't relax, uh, impact on property value, I think it has something to offer others. And then we interpret that to mean, so you agree with the development, that's great to hear. And that's when community starts to think about organizing, not so much to be a part of your engagement, but to organize against what you're talking about. When you're engaging in community, uh, when you want to do community engagement, um, we recommend that, uh, that you have a plan. And we actually have quite a few materials at um, Tamarack about how to do community engagement planning. And there's a workbook we keep updating. And Allison, maybe we, we could send that out to everybody after this, uh, after this webinar. But some of the key components of planning that, uh, that relate very much to evaluation is well, why are we doing this? What's our focus? Uh, you know, what kind of engagement are we doing? And I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. What values are guiding our intentions and our action? Uh, and so are we looking to have a broad, uh, uh, do we have a value about broad participation and inclusion? Uh, are we more focused on who we want to engage with? Uh, and when we talk about diversity uh, you know, of the audience, uh, it's, uh, diversity goes beyond demographics. So diversity isn't just about ethnicity and age and gender and so forth. It can also be about um, experience and where pe what, what influence people have in their neighborhood. Uh, so it's, it's uh, uh, in some ways not just what some people call surface diversity, but uh, some of the things more at the core of what drives people, what, no matter what demographic profile they fit. Um, so who are your engagement partners? And do you actually have a partnership goal? So uh, it, are, are you just going after any partner, or are there three or four partners that you really think are critical uh, to what you want to do? And then how, how do you actually set a goal and measure your procural or, or engagement of those partners? What outcomes are you trying to perceive, to achieve? And um, uh, outcomes with community engagement can really vary. I mean, outcomes can be uh, if, for example, you're engaging the community to build housing in, your, in the community or, or to uh, tackle a housing issue in the community, one of the outcomes would likely be what kinds of housing is being developed. Um, if you're looking at how to do community planning uh, and the outcome is create a community plan, you're not necessarily trying to predict the outcome of the plan, but you're trying to work towards the creation of one that fits your values of inclusion and so forth. 
And, and the other thing I want to mention, and I'm, I'm actually starting to do more a little writing uh, on this, is we often just look at what, what some people call lag measures. So those are the measures that at, when we're done doing what we do, we look back and we say, we say, did we achieve it? Uh, you know, so maybe we have a goal of uh, of um, engaging a thousand people, and when we're all done, we engaged 850, and we feel badly because we didn't hit a thousand. Catalytic measures in that context would be what kinds of activities do we need to measure that get us to that 1,000 goal? So, is it about the numbers of people that we actually invite? Maybe we have to invite 5,000 to get 1,000. Are some of the measures related to communication strategies about how often we promote this in neighborhood newspapers? Have uh, faith communities announced it at their, uh, at their services? Uh, send things home from, uh, from school with kids? Uh, these are our strategies of engagement, but sometimes we don't measure them. And then also in terms of catalytic measures, one could see methods that way. So what methods are necessary for optimal and equitable engagement? Not everyone can come to a town hall meeting. Not everyone will participate in a focus group or answer a survey. Uh, do you need to do door-to-door -door stuff? I mean, what's your online strategy if this is a major engagement? And then how do you measure that engagement versus what, what you anticipate or what you set as goals uh, for each kind of activity? Uh, what resources are needed, and I'm not just talking about money, but uh, you know, we need to do good engagement, we need space, we need facilities, uh, we need facilitators, uh, and are we, um, are, are there things there we should be measuring as well? And the same with communication. So communications will drive engagement, will inform people after engagements happen, hopefully to uh, motivate uh, others to uh, to join up. And so there's, there's catalytic measures here around who, uh, when, where, how, and why. So the, uh, the plan actually shapes the evaluation. And if we're, if we're not identifying as best we can some <clears throat> key measures, at least what, what we can measure in community engagement, I'm not saying you can measure everything, but uh, this is the time uh, to introduce that conversation is when you're actually doing the planning. Uh, I think community, community engagement to be successful has to be about what matters most to the community. Uh, sometimes it's about what matters most to, to, uh, to a segment of community or an institution or a health authority who's trying to uh, create some action around a particular health need, uh, but likely that's tied to what matters most about community too. So in your planning is how do, how do you actually figure out what matters most to community. Are there any game changers that could mobilize uh, your community? So, um, so for example, it's, it's what I mean by game changers in this context would be, how do you communicate the intent of this engagement? I was just talking to a colleague a, a while ago about um, the engagement that they tried to do around having safe injection sites in Edmonton and basically we're inviting the public to come to their institutions and ask questions and so forth and and they took the fact that no one came as a sign that cared and it was quite quite the opposite given the resistance to that they're experiencing now uh, as, you know as opposed to engaging the community and what should we do about uh, people who are doing drugs in our community leaving needles around and trying to include the community in figuring out what would be a game changer around uh, drug drug use and needle uh, dirty needles and so forth in our neighborhood. And in a community engagement um, effort, how do you move from divergence to convergence or so aspiration? So you're going to start with lots of people having lots of ideas, and at some point uh, you've got to go through a process of figuring out. How do all those divergent ideas, how do they uh, organize themselves thematically or into categories, and how do you work with the community to start looking at those themes or categories in a way that uh, they can start putting some priorities to what's most important or what matters most to them? 
you're going to have naysayers and people who don't like one another in a in a community engagement uh, in, in many community engagement uh, activities. And this is in in some of the work I've done. One of the major worries of people who want to host the engagement is that it's just going to turn into a uh, into a struggle or a fight. And um, there's no magic answer for that other than being being prepared for diversity at the table and trying to work with people uh, beforehand about being what we're doing uh, and during the engagement being open to opinions and ideas that uh, that people um, may have contrary to the majority or contrary to yours um, and, and do your best to work with them. Uh, there's tools you can use like uh, empathy maps and uh, give and get exercises, and we can share those with you as well. That sometimes need to uh, need to happen. Uh, I I worked recently with a community in uh, in Quebec, uh, and so they were, were worried about that. And what we did is we worked with everyone in the room around creating journey maps towards a future for kids, which then allowed people who had diverse opinions to input into that map. Uh, and uh, arguing people were really trying to figure it out together and then a key question is what obstacles do you bring with you to the CE table so often the obstacles we bring get in the way of an engagement sometimes we think the public doesn't know enough to be engaged about something or we uh, we have our biases around who should be included uh, and or what what method should be used and we have to figure out uh, you know how to be inclusive in the design of community engagement so that our biases don't rule the day so some tips um, and I'm it, you know before you might engage a neighborhood say in community planning or in dealing with a particular issue like uh, affordable housing uh, or food security in a neighborhood uh, one of the tips or one of the suggestions I have is to do some pre-engagement who are the leaders in that community? Where do people gather? You know, faith communities, uh, cafes. Uh, what's the? What are the natural meeting places for people in the community? And are you a part of that? Are you a part of any um, any initiatives going on in that community? Any tables that you might sit on before you try to launch or introduce a, a large scale engagement into the neighborhood? Are you trying to foster uh, some understanding? before reaching, trying to, to push for agreements and decisions. We can understand each other and still not agree, but often we don't spend the time uh, to, to make sure we understand the other person's or the other group's point of view, which becomes a, a, a real obstacle in, uh, if, if we just keep pushing towards agreements. And fostering understanding is also a way of dealing with what we often, uh, who we often see as naysayers. Uh, be diligent and transparent about organizing divergent ideas into common and connected themes or categories. So my, when I've done that with groups, I don't do it by myself. I try to include people from the community in working with all the ideas that have come out on, onto the table uh, so that what we create is uh, co-created and then what we create is uh, shared transparently with everybody uh, so that no one feels like uh, there's some hidden agenda. I already mentioned using some tools. If you really think there's conflicts that people are going to have, how can you use tools like empathy maps, give and get exercises, journey maps, and so forth to uh, try to ameliorate those tensions or channel them into more uh, productive uh, work together? And then ask community leaders how they view your organization uh, and what obstacles they might see. Ask, the, ask faith leaders, ask the city councilor who's in your area, uh, ask some of the natural leaders in the community, uh, are there any obstacles you're bringing to the table that you need to address with, with their community members? I also wanted to try to put collective impact in the context of community engagement. And uh, for me, at the core of collective impact is engagement. So. Uh, the very fact that people are coming together to start looking at a common agenda, for example, 
uh, some engagements happen. It might not be community engagement on a wide scale, but the, a core group has come together and are engaging one another and then trying to figure out who else do we engage to understand what our common agenda might be going forward. And, and then there's engagement uh, when we start looking at shared measures. The, the very uh, act of sharing suggests that we're uh, working together to try to figure out what are the measures that we want to, uh, to uh, work on together. Both, again, thinking of uh, lag measures, but also catalytic measures that will help us get to where we want to go. Mutually aligned activities uh, are usually what uh, we start to talk about next. Uh, and we talk about uh, continuous communication. Um, and then we also talk about backbone support. Now, in the Collective Impact 3.0 work that Tamarack's been doing and the paper that was authored by uh, Liz Weaver and Mark Cabage, um, you know, we started to look at the common agenda as a community aspiration. Community aspiration Im implies there is engagement going on. Shared uh, measurement became, becomes uh, also strategic learning. How do we learn as we go? And that doesn't just mean uh, the backbone group or are those sitting at the round table. How does the community learn as it goes? Uh, high leverage activities, how to focus on what matters most. And then this is where we identified that really this continuous communication, while important, is really um, a part of ongoing community engagement. And so engagement starts at the core, and then it, it, it surrounds everything else in an ongoing way, because collective impact is a long, a long game. It's not a six-month project. And um, so we see community engagement in a collective impact 3.0 model as being uh, fundamental to being able to uh, continue on with all the other work that exists uh, in a collective impact uh, model. Some of you may have seen this before, the spectrum of community engagement, and I wanted to speak to it a little bit. Um, trying to differentiate between uh, these five categories. So there are times when all we want to do is inform people. Uh, and basically we're saying, do this, we know best. And there are times when that's the perfect strategy if you're trying to get, um, uh, you know, people to act on, uh, on their health or get their children inoculated or, um, some kind, often we see informing in a health way as being experts informing the public on a health and safety concern and trying to prompt them to do something. Consulting is still, the control of consulting is still in the hands of the host. It's about wanting uh, your thoughts about what we want to do uh, and to get feedback and input and so forth. And I think we've all been a part of consultations and uh, uh, often with mixed reviews, I think, in terms of we felt like we gave our feedback, but nothing really happened. And then involving is a bit further along the continuum of help with, help us make this happen. Uh, you know, and it, it's still not um, involving community in what I would say in formative ways, but it might be help us understand the best way to make the LRT happen in your neighborhood. Uh, and so, uh, you know, basically that decision has been made and now community is being included. Shared leadership or a collaboration, uh, which would involve shared leadership in the LRT example, would be um, there, we, we want to look at is there potential for an LRT to go through your neighborhood for all these reasons? How would it benefit your neighborhood? What do you, what's your resistance to it? Uh, and work a little more uh, formatively around um, getting to that decision. Uh, and then on the far right, which we often don't work in, is the is kind of empowerment. So the final decisions are actually made by the public, and the, the institution institutional players are uh, involved in implementing those. So it's from us and them to we. 
uh, and um, it would be in the LRT example the, the community deciding yes we want the LRT here or no we don't and uh, that's an area where often our mandates as organizations and governments uh, were worried about that kind of empowerment because uh, it, it could very well conflict with what we think should be done. There's also different measures for uh, if you're trying to do a community engagement that includes community capacity building. So, uh, and this is uh, work that Aspen uh, has done quite a quite a good job with, Aspen Institute. So, if you're looking at building community capacity, uh, so that they have the ability to um, to act on their own issues and opportunities. Uh, you can see Aspen Institute's uh, definition of what that looks like and when you get this deck I encourage you to take a look at their uh, report here, their document around tools for practice on measuring community capacity building. And so again from their work, so what are some of the outcomes that you might want to measure in a, in a community capacity building uh, context? And so uh, communities are diverse. They're diverse by age, by ethnicity, by gender, by sexual orientation, by the kinds of work people do, uh, how many people aren't working, by, the, by people who uh, rent, by people who own businesses and community and so forth. How do you measure, how do you create expanded and diverse and inclusive citizen participation, but how do you measure that? Uh, as part of uh, part of the community engagement challenge in terms of measures, how do you understand what the current leadership base is and how do you grow it? How how do you actually create measures uh, to grow that? That's one of the challenges. And, and skill development the capacity is about knowing more, being able to do more, uh, being able to uh, act on your own. And uh, uh, all of us know the importance of building our skills in in order to do that. So. How would your community engagement create strategies, but also measures uh, around those strategies to build individual skills and community? And how would you build a widely shared understanding and vision of the future? How how would you create a strategic community agenda and and then measure the extent to which the public or the community actually uh, feels that that agenda resonates with them and they're supportive of it. Community capacity building is also often focused on better resource utilization by the community and some that can look like different things. It could look like better knowledge of the support and services that exist for that community and how to access them, but it also could be better resource utilization of service providers uh, in uh, working with community or changing how they utilize resources. Uh, and connected to that is um, how they might become more effective community organizations and institutions. And then the key there is to actually see if you can come up with some measures about what you, what you mean by more effective and who decides that. Um, and then uh, an obvious one is how do you um, create measures around consistent, tangible, uh, progress towards goals. And again, I encourage you to, to look at the Aspen document, it's quite helpful. So what are some signals of engagement? And this is helpful to look at in the planning stage because there are things you can measure that uh, pre and post, so to speak, or pre, during, and post. But if, uh, if your efforts relate to people being coming more involved in their community through volunteering or just citizen action is part of what you're doing, trying to promote uh, increased charitable giving in a community or to foster more political involvement, whether it's voting or sitting on uh, political uh, committees and boards or going to city council or signing a petition or attending a rally. Uh, are you looking to grow spiritual uh, activity in a community? Are, are, are looking for signals that women and seniors are more involved in uh, informal ways at, uh, at community leagues or other kinds of groups that meet to uh, work on community things or people creating or joining parent associations and so forth. These are uh, measurable 
signals of engagement, if you, especially if you identify them as these are some of the outcomes we're hoping for that will tell us that our engagement is working uh, and, uh, and they're, they're um, time consuming to measure but not complex to measure. I also uh, think sometimes we're not very realistic about uh, measures, so I'm going to use two examples. One comes out of uh, my back, uh, the, some of the emphasis of my work around housing the homeless. I'm not sure why the text is different sizes, but um, so you know, you can have a measure that um, on the left that, and then on the right, how difficult is it? Well. When we were housing people in the programs we operated, the number of people we housed and the numbers of those turned away is pretty easy and accurate to, to capture those numbers. The number of homeless people who are housed where they wanted to be housed, which is one of the objectives of Housing First, is fairly easy to do, but it's also subjective. Like, are, we, are, are people really being housed where they want to be housed, or are they settling, or are they telling us that, but they don't? really have an opinion or they don't like where they are housed. It's a little more subjective. Uh, the number on sex, uh, unsuccessfully housed and why, it's moderately difficult, especially the why part, and it's subjective. It's not always objective. The number of people you might rehouse, pretty easy and accurate to come up with. Who improved their quality of life because of housing? I think that's a higher degree of difficulty, and who actually decides if their quality of life improved? Uh, the number who are no longer needing housing first support after 18 months, which is kind of a, a rule or a guideline of housing first programs, at least in my community, after 18 months they should be off on their own doing fine. That's really hard to assess, but because it's a goal we set, there's a high risk of bias and pressure, especially from funders who think everything should be done in 18 months, and agencies who know the money will run out after 18 months. And to what extent are we saying, yeah, these folks are ready after 18 months only because we don't have a choice? And then, you know, often, uh, and I've heard from funders, you know, how, how do we know how successful you were long term? Like, how many homeless people are housed for three years because of our services? And I think that's a highly difficult, if not impossible, thing to attribute back to your uh your housing program. So the message here is be real about what measures matter and what measures can be tied back to the work you're doing. In terms of neighborhood development measures, capacity building measures, these are fairly easy. Numbers of participants by numbers of methods. You can come up with diversity numbers easily with respect to ethnicity. Um, you can identify the numbers of neighborhood leaders. People can give satisfaction scores. You can count website visits and downloads. They signal something around engagement, likes and follows on social media. Uh, and you can also uh, measure how many articles and stories you did. The hardest stuff to measure, which is really, if you think about it, what you're focusing on, is how effective are these growing number of neighborhood leaders, uh, what kinds of skills have been developed by how many people, and so, and so what impact are they having? Uh, did participants, you know, actually experience inclusion? Diversity and inclusion are not the same thing. Uh, you can have a whole bunch of diverse people in a room and nobody feels included. So inclusion is that process of bringing diversity together, and how do you measure that? Uh, how do you measure com uh, uh, resonance around common agenda uh, and, and so forth? I won't read all these to you. But this is where I think people get stuck because you, it's easy to, and you should measure the things on the left. And then what I think we're trying to do when we're measuring engagement is we, it, it's, it's quite, um, it's not just objective, it is subjective. And when there are subjective measures, to deal with, then my approach would be I need to be uh, inclusive of as many voices as I can to understand if we're making traction here. What community says about these things then actually matters, not just what we think happens. 
It doesn't mean it's objectively right or wrong, but if you've got uh, out of 100 community folks that you're consulting with, 85 are saying, I felt included. That tells you something uh, other than us thinking you were included because we had uh, diversity in the room. Some of you have made known the good work of my colleague and friend, Mark Kabaj, and I want to touch on uh, his five simple rules because I think they relate to community engagement, even though he was writing more about um, collective impact, and so i have uh, using his stuff and I've adapted some of it to fit the context of this presentation. Um, the, uh, so use evaluation to enable, not limit your strategic learning. And much, much of community engagement work, you don't really know and can't really predict what the outcome will be. Uh, so how do you learn as you go? And that's where I brought in the idea or the concepts of lag measures and catalytic measures. Uh, what, what measures should you be tracking that gets you to those lag measures, those final results that you want? Uh, just planning the work and working the plan can actually be an obstacle. There's a, a different kind of process you can use, and I'll share that in a minute. Uh, and then Mark's quote, uh, which I quite like, we need leadership that encourages bold thinking, tough conversations, which will happen at engagement sessions, experimenting, planning that is iterative and dynamic and management organized around a process of learning by doing. And this is what strategic learning in a sense looks like to me. You know, we start out by saying together, let's do something, whatever that might be. Uh, and then we look at how we design, act and measure that, uh, which leads us to some insights. We design, we act, we measure, we, we learn something, we get some insights. We go through a process of preserving what's working, adapting uh, to the environment, maybe shifting or even introducing things that aren't uh, new things because other things weren't working. Uh, we go through and create a, then a strategy. Uh, the strategy leads us on to the next in terms of we get, uh, we look at what we're gonna preserve, adapt, shift, we get insights and we kind of go full circle. Uh, and uh, it's a continual process, not a create a plan, then just work it uh, and make the plan come true. Rule number two is employ multiple designs for multiple users. People will want different things out of community engagement. Uh, you know, city council might want some things that are different from what your organization wants that are different from what community uh, leaders want. And so how do you create a design that uh, weaves all those together? And I've included some design questions which I've, I've, I've touched on uh, uh, previously, um, and so I won't read them all. But um, one of the things to think about in your design is what are some of your timing realities, both in a macro and micro way. So. Do you have a deadline when you have to to deliver a community plan, for example, to city council? I'm working on an initiative now that has that kind of deadline. So the timeline realities, there has to be in your plan uh, an opportunity to look at what I call micro timelines that will get you there. Uh, what do you already know about the people you want to engage? Do you know enough? Uh, maybe there's some discovery that needs to happen uh, before you design the final approach to community engagement as well as how you measure it. Be thoughtful and cautious about shared measurement. There's been groups that have gotten stalled because they try to come up with the perfect shared measurement uh, system uh, and uh, so they didn't do anything until they did. Uh, check yourself, are you looking at just uh, lag measures or are you also striving for catalytic measures that help you Think about how you will mutually align your activities. Uh, again, catalytic measures are those things you track because they actually, if you do them, they uh, inform the results that you're, or they, you stand a better chance of getting to those measures that lag behind. So just to give you a quick example in case I, uh, um, uh, there's some confusion or lack of clarity about that, I'll use a fundraising example. Uh, if I want to raise a million dollars, uh, and, and I just say to my team, go raise a million dollars, write some proposals and, you know, get some more money from donors. 
uh, isn't good enough, and then you know we find out we only raised 800, then we feel bad. Whereas we know in, uh, that some of the catalytic measures we should be tracking are how many contacts we have with donors, how many um, asks do we make. Uh, and so there, the goals around your catalytic measures, if you hit those goals, uh, you stand a much better chance of hitting the bigger goal, and you don't want to find out that you didn't hit it after you're done with the work. Seek out intended and unintended consequences. So um, we know that um, community engagement produces things, community collective impact produces things that uh, weren't expected. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, in Mark's article, he wrote about community roof gardens. And one of the unintended and unexpected positive, uh, positive outcomes was when you install community roof gardens on roofs, it lowers uh, heat costs because of the insulation. An unintended negative uh, um, consequence that people needed to be sensitive to is when there are successful initiatives doing social development, social enterprise development for women, and where women were now making money and being successful uh, at what they were doing, it created family strife with their husbands who were out of work and who were feeling demoralized and like they weren't uh, uh, contributing uh, in ways that now uh, their uh, wives were, or partners were. And housing the homeless um, it can have negative uh, consequences, such as, uh, you know, a homeless person who's been homeless for 10 years now has a place to leave and now feels even more socially isolated than they did when they lived on the street because they have no friends where they live, uh, they, they're not used to living in a community uh, like we do. They're used to being on the street and their social network was street-based. And so we, we uh, when you're looking at how you design both your plans and your evaluations, you can't predict negative consequences, but you've got to look at them and be open to them as a surface. Attribution analysis and contribution analysis, um, really think about um, to what extent can you attribute your actions, the, the result of, uh, of your actions back to you. So to what extent do you cause things? It's very hard to prove that. And in some ways, collective impact is, is saying to us, if we're collaborating and then trying to attribute everything back to our organizations, we're missing the point. If we're focused more on how we can contribute to change uh, and how change actually happens uh, so that we can measure progress as opposed to proof of results, uh, sometimes that's the way to go. And so um, it, I, I'd ask you to take a look at this because I'm, I'm sensitive to time and to try to understand the difference, uh, differences between the two, and uh, which I cover also in a, in a paper I wrote on game changer evaluation. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to talk a little bit about community engagement scorecards, and, um, and then uh, I'm happy to entertain any questions. But I was just reading uh, uh, in a book in a, um, on, a, on how to execute strategy, and uh, in that, there was a little story, and what the guy was writing, what the author was writing, he said, uh, imagine going to a football game where there's no scoreboard, and uh, all you have as a reference is watching the team on the, on the uh, field. No announcer, no scoreboard, you, you don't know who's winning, who's losing, what down it is, how many yards to the next first down. It would, it would um, seriously impact your ability to understand and to participate in, in that experience. Um, and so the, the lesson for me is, or the message to me is, we need scoreboards. And we need scoreboards that aren't just for leaders. We need scoreboards that are for everybody who's trying to understand how well are we doing. And, um, and they can be simple, uh, fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, but if we're not measuring both our lag measures and al but also our catalytic measures, how do we know how we're doing? So I'm going to share a few scoreboards with you. Some of them uh, 
still have challenges, and I'll try to speak to them. But to give you a sense of how uh, some other community uh, communities have dealt with scoreboards, and maybe that'll twig uh, some thinking about what you're doing. So one of the uh, one of I think a great example of a community engagement initiative uh, was what the Alberta government did some years ago. I don't know, four or five years ago now, uh, which was launched by uh, actually the progressive conservatives when they wanted to develop a social policy framework. And they committed to uh, wanting what, really what they talked about was optimal engagement of, of people from ac across Alberta. And so this was their website. And I just wanted to point out some of the aspects of this website that whether or not you can create a website like this, there's good components here to think about. So in their materials, whether it's a website or it's a, a brochure or whatever they're sending out, they've, give, they've said, here's our purpose. Uh, we want to create a social policy framework. Uh, and they, they, that tells people exactly what's, what are we doing? What's the context here? Read this discussion guide. This will help you understand. What's the call to action? So, you know, the call to action is about what you can do, uh, how you can be a part of this, uh, you know, what's the, me the methods, there's the library, there's the blog, there's a survey, there's discussion kits, there's public council discussions, so that people could see uh, there's a choice about how I can be involved. Uh, and then there was a timeline, here's where what we're doing, here's where we want to be at the end of this time cycle, here's some milestones. Uh, along the way, the, where we where we're trying to uh, uh, get get certain things done that will help us get to the final product, and then they track all this activity, and um, so they would report on this on their website and the materials. They would uh, report along the way as they were doing consultations. You know, how many tweets, site visits, community conversations took place, how many a number of people were reached, unique people, and how many uh, community discussions took place, how many people attended them, how many locations were there across the province. The, the thing that I'm not, I don't know if they did, and maybe they thought they couldn't, and that's why I've asked this question, is that these are helpful numbers, but they would be far more helpful if we understood what our intentions were. Were we intending to reach 50,000 people or were we intending to reach 25? Were we hoping to do 500 community discussions or was the goal 350? So those things are important in a dashboard because it tells you in a sense if you're winning. Are you winning or are you lagging behind? And so um, sometimes these goals aren't set because we don't really know how many um, how many people will participate, but usually there's something in our community engagement that we do know. So in this case with the, with the province, they could have identified a number of how many total community conversations do we want to have uh, and, uh, and then worked towards that and so that, you know, if we want to have 400 and we want at least 20 people at each one, that tells you what the goal for participants might be. And if we wanted to have uh, locations from across the province, then you'd start looking at locations based on geography, and maybe you would come up with a goal about how many locations. Um, so there are, I think, ways to, uh, to uh, create goals that reflect your intent on having broad consultations, in the, at least in the context of this initiative. They track unique visitors to websites and how many returned. Uh, I'm, you know, and uh, that tells you something. Those two numbers tell you something about interest. Uh, they tracked how many site visits and what was downloaded. Uh, they, I don't know of any goals that they had around that, but certainly this would inform uh, future engagements that they might want to do in terms of uh, trying to mirror past performance. Uh, and then how many people completed uh, surveys, how many submitted uh, to, through the library, how many people posted wiki entries, user comments on the wiki site, and so forth. These, uh, again, these measures without goals are a little, are harder to understand in terms of progress, 
but sometimes you, you go through these things to create baselines for future engagements if you're going to do them again. Here's something, where the, again, where they could have been intentional. So uh, what's your geographic scope? They could have said, like I said earlier, so many locations uh, is what we're going to do. Uh, this shows you uh, how, where they had their consultations and, uh, and how many. The city uh, of Surrey has, a, I think, an incredibly great dashboard. And uh, when you get this, you can click on the link and go there. But uh, they have along the left all kinds of things they're tracking. And then when you pick one, uh, let's see, like I picked education and culture, if I had dropped down here, there would be uh, many choices. I picked high school graduation. And it gives you a little bit about why this is a measure. It shows your goal across time and then your annual performance in getting there. And so in Surrey, they can see there there is overall since 2007 progress uh, in the high school graduation, um, in high school graduation rate. So take a look at that dashboard and play with it. It might be a great point of conversation with say uh, city council about both the complexity but the utility of doing this kind of measures. And then there's simple ones to do, and I, I found this spreadsheet uh, that was about something else, and I just adapted it to uh, community engagement as an example. If you want something that's simple, where you're tracking over time, how many door-to-door -door did you do, how many focus groups, how many um, focus group participants, uh, how many people are following you on Facebook and so forth. What's missing from this sheet is also goals. So you you might be able to track activity, but were, what were your door-to-door -door goals? What were your focus group goals and so forth? So that you have that scoreboard helping you understand are we on target or aren't we? So uh, before I open it up uh, for questions, um, just a quick summary, identify the context and the boundaries as best you can. Where are you wanting to work on the spectrum? Are you wanting to inform? Are you, are you on the other side of trying to empower? Uh, what do you want to happen as a result of the engagement? What can you measure? Are you considering catalytic measures, not just after the fact measures or lag measures? How will you pre-engage? How will you design the seat? design the engagement to seek diversity and foster inclusion? Who should lead what based on skills, trust, and experience? How will you ensure you're transparent? And can you, can you actually measure transparency? And what are the logistics of inclusive engagement? So there might be some even logistical measures that you, uh, and goals and measures that you want to track. So I, I'm going to answer a question that came in by email. I'm sorry uh, I went on a bit longer, but um, one of the questions that came in to me was, well, I understand uh, the community engagement is imperative. Assessing it seems subjective despite the various tools out there. And I, w I was being asked to react to that. And my answer is, yeah, much of it is, a, is subjective, but maybe not as much as you think. There are things you can measure that show uh, to, uh, as individual measures, but also collectively, that people feel engaged, are engaged, they're showing up. Uh, a fact over time, where it's, let's say when we're doing town hall meetings or community planning meetings, uh, one of the measures that I'm working on when, uh, with the Mohawk Tribal Nation and their community engagement activities will include, as we do community planning, uh, how do we want to grow uh, participation not see it dissipate over time. And so if 200 people came to the first set of community planning meetings, what's going on uh, the, on the next round? Is it 240? Is it 150? How do we measure uh, the fact the, that kind of momentum that we want to see by uh, having more and more people involved? So sure, <coughs> there's subjectivity to it, but don't let that stop you from figuring out where you can measure things and draw some conclusions from them and where there are uh, things uh, that are subjective, uh, how do you include uh, an appropriate number of uh, diversity of people in looking at, at those things? And the last thing I'd say about that is even 
when we look at measures that we say are objective, how we interpret those measures or those results is usually sub subjective. So uh, all data can be seen as fact, but how we analyze and interpret data is often the stories that we uh, give to data and our stories sometimes vary. So um, you have to work with both objectivity and subjectivity. And I'm going to stop there. I'm, uh, um, we'll send out these decks and uh, there will be some other attachments I'll ask Allison to send you that might be helpful, like the community planning document, some of the tools, Allison, we have around empathy maps and, and so forth. Um, no reason why those can't go out to our participants. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mark. And perhaps also because we do have some questions that were sent in both before the webinar and during, uh, maybe we can send you those and uh, you could respond to some of them in writing and we could include that in the follow-up email as well. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, so I have a couple of closing announcements. Um, first one, stay in touch with Vibrant Communities, Cities Reducing Poverty. Uh, receive the latest thinking, news, tools, and resources from around the poverty reduction community by subscribing to our bi-monthly newsletter, Cities Connect, and visit vibrantcanada.ca. Also, if you enjoyed this webinar, you can join us on June 15th at 1 o'clock Eastern Time for Collaborating with the Enemy. Uh, this is Adam Kahani who will be presenting his new book where he argues that conventional understanding of collaboration is wrong and will present a new approach to collaboration that embraces discord, experimentation, and genuine co-creation. Uh, you'll be able to register for that using the link uh, that you'll receive in our follow-up email. We have an in-person event coming up, Tamarax Deepening Communities, June 6th to 8th in Montreal. Neighborhoods, the Heart of Community, Mobilizing for Impact. This will be a unique and bilingual international learning event, bringing together the most innovative and inspiring examples of neighborhood action at its best. We'll also send this link to you in the follow-up. You'll receive that email in the next, uh, by, before Friday, and that will include a link to the audio recording of today's call, which you're welcome to share with your colleagues, as well as the learning opportunities that I've mentioned. You can also send any feedback for this webinar to Natasha at tamarackcommunity.ca. We're always looking to improve on your webinar experience. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you all have a great day. Yep, thanks, everybody. Bye.